Hi everyone, today we are finishing our tour of Newtonian dynamics with an exploration of the concepts embedded in rotational dynamics. So as we've built up our knowledge through the uh, semester so far, what we've done is we've started with the motions of point particles, then we explained why those zero-dimensional masses will move through the process of forces, then we've turned around and described how extended bodies will rotate and how they move, and now we discuss why they move. So we need the analog of forces, we need the analogs of energy, and we need the analogs of momentum uh, that we associate with our um, extended bodies undergoing rotation. So our analogies continue with the action that we have in uh, with linear uh, descriptions of motion. And here we're going to, instead of talking about the forces that lead to accelerations, we are going to introduce the topic of torque. And torque is the thing that creates angular accelerations. Uh, similarly, forces acting through distance do work, and torques acting through angular displacements also do work. We do not need a separate description of work for rotational and linear uh, motion because they are both creating energy, just rotational energy comes from the work that's done through torques acting through angular displacements. Uh, finally, just as forces over time create impulse, which then change an object's momentum, uh, those torques acting over time end up changing angular momentum. And so we're going to build up the ideas today of torque and angular momentum. We focused a bit on work and energy last time, but we'll sort of develop some of those ideas uh, uh, briefly. But we're going to focus a lot on the torques and the angular momentum. So let's get to it. Well, first off, let's define what a torque is. A torque needs a description of an angular, uh, something that creates an angular acceleration. And it turns out that that's going to depend on two things. Uh, a force is just kind of a force, but a torque actually uh, depends on how you look at a system. So a torque is going to represent how much force is applied to an object that's going to rotate, and how far from the axis of rotation that force is acting. If we think about a door or a hinge or something that rotates around a pivot point, so this object is sort of free to move here, and we exert a force on that object, uh, it's going to rotate, uh, but the weird thing about it is that only one component of the force is going to change the angular acceleration. If I have the second component here, the F cos phi, that's the Greek letter phi, that's just going to push and pull on the hinge. It's not going to actually turn this object up or down. Instead, only this component is going to matter. Similarly, if you act to bring this force into the center of the pivot point, it's just not as effective at rotating this object. This is why with doors, the handle is opposite the location of where the hinges are. It's because you can exert a force. If you've ever tried to open or close the door by just pushing right next to the hinges, you know it requires way more force to uh, push uh, that door open. So it depends on how far that force is acting from the pivot point and uh, the direction of the force relative to the direction the object can rotate. We're going to call the moment arm is the distance from the pivot point uh, where a force is being calculated or a torque is being calculated out to where that force is acting. So that's the moment arm and it is the vector uh, from the pivot to where the force acts, not the other way around, not force to pivot. It is pivot point to force and later we'll generalize to a case where we don't even think about objects pivoting. We just consider the point at which we consider our, the torque the origin of the torque. So it starts there and goes to wherever the force is acting on an extended object. We define a torque mathematically in uh, a vector form is torque is the moment arm as a vector cross product with the force uh, F. So R cross F is the force. Order matters. More on that in a second. 
Uh, we can consider the magnitude of a torque here, and we'll just use that as a single letter uh, tau, which is the moment arm, length of the moment arm, times the force times the sine of the angle between those two vectors when they are slid over and placed tail to tail. So if I have a pirate wheel here, and I consider uh, that you used to steer pirate ships, this is the moment arm here, R comes out. The force is acting, or sort of spinning the, pirate's, uh, steer, uh, the pirate ship's steering wheel. To calculate the angle between them, I take this force F, and I slide it down so that it is tail to tail, and that's the angle that we uh, calculate. So that gives us our angle and our definition of these two, even though the force and the moment arm will have kind of a tip to tail relationship, put those tails together to figure out the angle between them. Okay, we are going to also often focus on a two dimensional object or sort of a one, like we're kind of look at a system from the top down in which case we are going to end up defining uh, the torques as if we are looking down on those objects along the, plot, the, plus, the positive Z axis. And so that means we're going to give some signs to the torques. And if we're looking down along the positive Z axis, that means that when an object is rotating counterclockwise, we're going to give that a positive torque, kind of in the mathematics sense, measured from x equals zero line in the counterclockwise direction. That sense of angle, we're going to give that the direction and call that positive torque. Similarly, negative torques are going to operate uh, clockwise. So if I have this axis system here, x and y, in this case, the Z axis is going to be coming out of the plane of the screen towards you, poke you right in the eye. So watch out for that Z axis right there. Uh, and that is, and when we're looking down on that, counterclockwise torques will be positive and clockwise torques will be negative. So let's think about how to find the net torque around this axle O if we have uh, kind of a two, uh, sort of two axes, uh, two axles, uh, where we have an inner radius and we have an outer radius here. And we have one force that's acting on the inner radius, and then these two forces here are on the outer radius. So we just calculate the net torque by adding up the, net, uh, the individual torques all together. So we can just uh, calculate. I'll start out here and call this torque right here. This is going to be tau 1. And tau 1 is going to have a uh, magnitude that is going to be, uh, we'll go, I think we'll need a little room. So tau 1 is equal to RF sine of the angle between them. As I've defined it, it is acting a distance of A from the center of the uh, axis. It's spinning around here and it is going in the clockwise direction. So we're going to say torque number one is going to be equal to negative A, or let's put in some numbers here. So it's going to be negative. The axis here is one meter, and then the force on that is going to be nine newtons, and it is, the angle between these two vectors is going to be 90 degrees, sine of 90 degrees, and you can see that if I imagine constructing this axis right here, heading out from the pivot point out to where the force is acting on it, the, and then I slid this vector over so it uh, lined up tail to tail. I think I can actually do the sliding. Yeah, there we are, like that. Then it is going to have a 90 degree angle between them. And so sine of 90 is one. And so this is going to create a torque around this axis of negative nine Newton meters. Next, let's do this uh, force up here as creating torque two. So in that case, tau two is equal to R. Well, R is larger now. R goes from zero out here and is gonna have a length of B. So that radius is going to be two two meters times the force, which is 10 newtons, 
Again, it's acting perpendicular to the moment arm, so that's going to be a sine of 90 degrees. And it's acting in the clockwise direction, so that means it's going to be negative. So this is going to be negative 20 newton meters. Next, and last, is tor uh, torque 3. And so tau 3 is not acting at a 90 degree angle, which makes this, you know, slightly complicated. And so what we need to do is figure out the angle that it is acting. So if I think about that one, I have a moment arm that goes out like this uh, here. And then I can uh, go ahead and lasso that and sort of put those vectors tail to tail like so. And there's going to be a nice 90 degree angle here of which this angle is 30 degrees, so this will be 60 degrees. So we have that the torque there is going to be 1 meter times 12 newtons times the sine of 60 degrees, and it's going to be acting in the positive direction. And so that's going to be equal to plus 10.39 newton meters. And if I add up tau 1 plus tau 2 plus tau 3, I'm going to get that's minus 18.6 newton meters. So that's how we calculate some torques given there. You know, there's a lot of sliding vectors and figuring out angles between them. I keep saying the unit newton meters, and uh, that's kind of an uh, interesting idea. Dia, it sort of falls out of the equation here. It's, you know, moment arm is in meters, uh, force is in newtons, and angle, the sign, has no units. So it's a newton time a meter, but it's also a joule, right? Because uh, a newton times a meter has the same units of joules. This is just kind of a coincidence of being a force times a distance here. We usually keep this distinct in our head by calling the units of torque newton meters and then calling the units of energy joules because they are not the same concept. So I'll be kind of particular and say, oh, it's just the newton meter. Um, it's kind of shows up in similar mechanics. Uh, torque is the uh, component of the force that's perpendicular to a moment arm. Uh, work is kind of projection in the parallel direction. So these end up being very distinct concepts. Uh, it's neat to know uh, if you are an automotive aficionado, you sometimes will hear engines as providing a certain amount of foot pounds of torque. It's the same idea. It's a moment arm times a force. Uh, and so those, that's kind of the imperial unit for torque is a foot pound. And because we live in North America, uh, that makes the units come out in uh, the imperial uh, values when you're describing engines. Don't even get me started on horsepower again. Anyways, so foot pounds of torque, uh, newton meters of torque, we leave these as distinct units. Now, much like uh, other th things like potential energies uh, or uh, kinetic energies, these depend on your choices of origin. But the um, description here for the torque is quite physically meaningful. Potential energy is less important, but kinetic energy depends on your frame of reference. Uh, torque also depends on the specified axis. So the torque is always has to refer to the torque with respect to a specified axis. And usually we're going to pick the axis around which the object is rotating. Sometimes we'll have some more freedom, which we can abuse to our advantage. So coming back, uh, it's worth remembering that torque is a cross product of a force uh, of a moment arm times the force. And so we should remember some key properties of the uh, torque vector. Uh, first is we get our direction by using the right hand rule. You put your hand out along the moment arm and then you uh, turn your hand in the direction of the force and then your thumb will point in the direction of the torque. Uh, cross products, please remember, are anti-commutative, so that means order matters. So R cross F is not F cross R. Uh, we can distribute the uh, cross product, so A cross B plus D is A cross B plus A cross C. Uh, and then 
as we'll find out a little later, we can take this under a product rule by saying that uh, the time derivative of A cross B, this is the new one, is we just apply the product rule and keep the cross product in between. Time derivative of A cross B, and then A plus A cross the time derivative of B. Product rule. We uh, also know that if A and B are parallel, we the uh, angle between them is zero, uh, so the sine theta the term is zero, and so A cross B will also be zero. Similarly, if they're perpendicular, then the magnitude of A cross B is just going to be the magnitude of A times B, and that sine phi term is going to be equal to sine 90, which comes out to be one, hence we get AB. So Let's remember these math facts as we plow off across uh, various directions. So first off, we can absolutely just calculate a uh, cross product based torque. I can give you a force with unit vectors and a torque or a moment arm um, uh, that is given by a displacement. We'd like to calculate the torque exerted, exerted by a certain force on a ball that's a certain displacement measured relative to the coordinate axes. So this is asking us secretly, calculate what R cross F is. Tau is equal to R cross F. Well, in this case, we have uh, the, just a cross product. So we can use this uh, method of Ceres uh, that I like to use for cross products. You can remember it any way you like. Uh, I'm going to write this down, uh, and then the first thing I write down is the row of for R, and then I wrote down, write down the components for F in terms of the unit vectors. So R is uh, units of minus 1J plus 5K, so its ith component is 0, its jth component is negative 1, and then its kth component is 5, and then the force is just going to be uh, 3 in the I direction, minus two in the j direction, and zero in the k direction. And then what we do is we write down ij again, we repeat the entries underneath them, minus one, minus two, and then we calculate the positive components by multiplying uh, those three uh, things together and adding them up. So this is uh, minus one times zero times i hat, zero, uh, plus 15 j hat plus 0 k hat. Then we come back and go the other direction and ascribe negative signs to those products. So we do these diagonals uh, going back in that direction. And so then we get that this is, uh, we, we add plus, uh, or sorry, I should say we subtract, we do minus, and then this is negative one time, oh, sorry, uh, uh, negative one times three times k hat. So that's negative three, and then there's the negative in front. So that gets us to become plus three k hat. And then we do negative two times five times i hat, uh, and then we subtract that. So it's plus 10 uh, i hat. And then we have uh, zero times zero times j hat, and that's just zero. So then we collect like terms, uh, get some cancellations, cancel, cancel, and then we find out what we got. We got uh, the torque is equal to 10i uh, plus 15j plus 3k newton meters. So if we need to calculate vector torques and we have units in components, we just calculate the cross product that way. Uh, we're going to mostly rely on the RF sine phi construction and the right-hand rule, uh, but it's good to know that we can do this from arbitrary unit vectors. Okay, moving right along. Torques create angular accelerations. And the uh, way we can sort of see this is imagine a particle on a circular trajectory that is kind of held together there by the normal force, or a, sorry, a force that is creating a normal direction acceleration of magnitude uh, v squared over r. And then the tangential component there is going to be the thing that accelerates it. 
Uh, so if we think about this thing that's creating the angular acceleration, I just want to note first off that the torque from the normal direction force is zero. Uh, so there is no torque from that. And so we only consider the torque for the tangential direction force. And if we think about that, this little particle here is being pushed on uh, by some net force. So it experiences an acceleration m times a t. So the tangential component of the acceleration is uh, but from the sum of the forces in the tangent direction. Now, uh, let's consider this in terms of magnitude. Well, we see if we take this expression up here and multiply both sides by r, uh, you notice that r times f sub t is the torque. And then that's m times the tangential acceleration times r. And then we'll rewrite the tangential acceleration as r times the angular acceleration, kind of undoing what we usually do. And then we'll collect our r's and we get m r squared alpha. And then the uh, clever person will note that, wait, m r squared? That's something we've seen before. Well, that's the moment of inertia. And so then we end up with an expression that says that the sum of the torques is equal to mr squared, the moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration. And we can write down this for a bunch of objects acting in a rigid body or in a rigid body. And we get that the sum of torques is i times alpha for an extended system by generalizing a point particle. And the rule that we've learned is that by counting for things at, uh, under this moment of inertia, adding up mr squared over a distributed body, we get the right component. So this is neat because it gives us our analog of Newton's second law. We have the sum of the forces or the sum of the torques. Uh, so torques are like masses or torques are like forces. That's the actual word. The moment of inertia is the equivalent of a mass and sort of like a mass. And then alpha, the angular acceleration, is the equivalent of a linear acceleration. So this is F equals MA, just angular style. Well, let's actually do a little bit of an application here. So a solid cylindrical axis with uh, M and R as specified in a car is subject to 300 Newton meters of torque. Uh, if it starts at rest, how fast is it rotating after two seconds? Well, we know uh, that the sum of the torques, sum of torques is equal to I times alpha. And we'd like to figure out uh, that uh, there's only a single torque. So this is just says that uh, sum of I alpha is equal to torques. I'd like to know the angular acceleration, and that's the torque over the moment of inertia. And then if I want to figure out it's a constant torque, so constant angular acceleration, then the uh, angular speed at a certain time is the initial speed plus alpha times T. And that is going to be just equal to tau over the moment of inertia, torque over inertia times time. And that's because the initial angular speed is zero. So we are happy to just stick in our torque, uh, which is 300 newtons per meter, or 300 newton meters, it's not a spring, divided by the moment of inertia, which is one half mr squared. So I should note that up here, i is a half mr squared for a solid cylinder. That's where that comes from. So we get a half times 100 kilograms times the radius, which is 0 0.05 meters quantity squared times the time, which is two seconds. And if I put it all in, I get an answer of 4,800 radians per second. So that gives us uh, all the pieces that we need uh, to solve a simple F equals MA problem, just angular style. Let's consider something a little more extensive, uh, namely pumping iron or something like that. Anyways, uh, we can consider what's happening in uh, lifting a 15 kilogram weight at a constant angular speed uh, using uh, a bicep. And 
the weight is going to be held in a human's hand right here and is going to exert a uh, force downward and a torque in the clockwise direction around the elbow, which is a pivot point. And that's opposed by this bicep, which is pulling upward. And you'll notice that your bicep connects to your elbow joint or your elbow joint quite close to the pivot point. You don't have a uh, tendon or anything that runs from your shoulder straight across to your wrist. It uh, connects down here at your elbow. Uh, so we can set this up as a torque problem. Let's uh, engage in showing off some truly beautiful representations of a human arm. So there's an arm. Uh, and applying to that arm, there is a force of gravity pointed downward and a force from the bicep pointed upward. And then there is a pivot point here. And that force downward is mg. That force upward we will call the bicep f bicep. And we know that for this system, the sum of the torques in the system is going to be equal to zero because there is a constant angular speed. That's our right here, constant angular speed. And so that means that uh, omega not, or sorry, omega is just equal to, sorry, alpha is equal to zero. Thus, we can just calculate the torques and set them equal to each other, uh, or set the sum of them equal to zero. So in this case, uh, we have picked a 90 degree angle, which is very helpful for us because that means that all the forces are oriented at 90 degree angles with respect to their moment arms. And the first moment arm, the force of the bicep, so the torque from the bicep, is going to be the force from the, let's do the length of the moment arm first, just to be clear. Uh, so that's going to be the length of the moment arm, which is five centimeters, times the force from the bicep, which we don't know. Uh, and then it's going to be times the sine of 90 degrees because the moment arm is perpendicular to the force right here. That is perpendicular to that. The torque from the weight is just going to be the length of the moment arm. So that's 30 centimeters times the weight, which is mg, also times sine of 90 degrees. And it's going to be negative because it's acting in the clockwise direction. So then we add up these two torques, uh, tau weight plus tau bicep equals zero. And so that's going to give us that the force, uh, so five centimeters times the force of the bicep is going to be equal to, uh, sorry, minus 30 centimeters times mg is equal to zero. And then we will solve for the force of bicep is equal to 30 centimeters times the mass, which is 15 kilograms, times 10 meters per second squared, all divided by five centimeters. And so that's going to give us an answer of 900 newtons. Now, if you look at this, you note that mg, note, mg for this weight is 150 newtons. So your body, when you're doing curls, actually has to really work against torque. It magnifies the impact of that weight, whatever you're lifting, by a factor of six in our cartoon anatomy of a human arm, just because of where the bicep is located or pulling around the uh, elbow joint relative to where the weight is pulling around uh, the joint. So it's it you know requires a lot more force because you don't have a lot of advantage. And if you actually want to pick up a 15 kilogram weight, uh, a curl is a relatively inefficient way of doing that uh, with your arm. Let's get a little more physics oriented and uh, move on to a classic example. This is a case where we have a massive pulley, which has a thin disc with mass M and radius R on a frictionless axle. It's right there. 
Uh, a spool of light rope, means we don't its mass, uh, is wound around the pulley and attached to mass M, which is shown right there. System is released from rest, and I'd like to know what the tension in the rope is. Ooh, that's exciting. So let's set up a coordinate system here that says that we care about forces like this. This is X and this will be Y. Really, we are only gonna worry a little bit about Y. And we need to relate uh, this system. So much like last week, we have a case where the angular speed and acceleration of this uh, pulley is going to be related to the linear speed of the uh, mass. So we are going to have the relationship that R times alpha is going to be equal to the tangential acceleration, which is going to be equal to the acceleration of the little mass, A sub M. So this is going to, like the constraints of the problem just give us this kinematic relationship. So let us start by writing down the sum of the forces on the little mass which is going to, if we write down its free body diagram, it has an mg pulling down and a tension pulling up. So the forces in the coordinate system given is T minus mg is going to be equal to ma. And I'm picking that. I kind of expect A to be negative uh, given where we're going because it's gonna fall down, but let's see if that falls out of the mathematics. So write down the sum of the forces for the little mass. The sum of the forces for the pulley, kind of boring. Uh, the sum of the forces for that one are going to be that there is a tension force pulling down on the pulley. There's going to be a axle force. And then there's going to be mg for the weight of the pulley. I'm going to kind of ignore this set of forces because the sum of these forces is going to be zero because that pulley isn't moving its center of mass. And that's really just going to specify what the axle force is, which the problem doesn't care about. What we do care about is that the sum of the torques for the pulley is going to be equal to I times alpha. And we note that the sum of the tor and I for this system is going to be one half m r squared because it is a thin disk. So thin disk gives us a half m r squared. Uh, so that's I times alpha. And if I group r times alpha together here, what I will get is that this is one half m r times a specified. So now we're going to write down the torques on the pulley. Well, the torques on the pulley are going to be uh, from these three forces, the axle forcing up and the mg forcing down, we're going to consider them with respect to the rotation axis. And in this case, the sum of the torques is going to be, well, it's going to be the force of the axle times zero because the moment arm is zero. That's a force that is acting at the center of the object, and so the length of the moment arm is zero. So the moment arm has a length of zero. Similarly, mg is going to have, or the weight is also going to have a moment arm of zero. So mg times zero, I guess formally this is negative zero because that matters not at all. Uh, and then we're going to have the torque from the tension, and that's going to be acting in the negative, clock, uh, negative uh, direction or the clockwise direction. And so that's going to have a magnitude of minus T times R. And that is going to be one half M R times A. So recall that the tension is acting a distance R from the center. So it has R from the center. Uh, there's the tension. They intersect at a 90 degree angle. Uh, so the sine angle uh, component is going to be one. And so then that's going to act in, and it's acting clockwise. So it's pulling down. So that's where we get that the torque is negative T times R. Well, uh, now we actually have a full system that we can uh, calculate because we know uh, from here that I can also cancel an R from both sides in this equation right here. 
and I get the result that the tension force is equal to minus one half m times the acceleration. And then I can use this relationship here in this expression there and solve for the acceleration, get that out of here. So then we're going to plug that in and we're gonna get minus one half m times a minus mg is equal to little m times a. And so then the acceleration uh, is, oh, let's uh, group some more terms. So we'll get minus mg is equal to little m times a plus a half big M times A, and then the acceleration is then just minus mg over little m plus a half big M. Negative as hoped for because we've defined up uh, to be positive, so it means the system accelerates down. Great. That's not what we cared about, what we came here for. We came here for the tension, but fortunately we have an expression for the tension in terms of the acceleration. So then we can plug this expression up into that tension equation, and we will find that T is equal to minus a half M times negative MG over M plus a half big M. And then we will cancel out the negative signs and we'll get an expression that looks like M times little m times G over two little m plus big M. And that's with tension force. And has the right units, has units of force. So looks looks good. There's our answer is complete. I feel good about that. Let's box it in. Yeah. Ooh. The next thing we need to worry about is what happens when we combine forces and torques together to understand the motion or sometimes the lack of motion of objects. And we're going to start out with the case where things do not move, uh, and we call this the study of statics. Uh, and this is identifying what the forces and torques when an object is in a static equilibrium. It doesn't go anywhere, and all the forces and torques are balanced. This is a really important subject in the field of engineering because you really want to make sure that the things that you design don't move under various changes of forces and everything. So you're really excited about things remaining static. Like bridges really should be a study of statics. It's so important that they have an entire first year course on just this set of problems. And then from here, they if you go on in mechanical engineering, you get more uh, complicated statics problems uh, that take into account time varying forces and all kinds of exciting stuff. But for us in physics, we do this in about 15 minutes uh, because uh, we I don't have to build anything. And let's be honest, that's really a good thing. Okay, so in a case of uh, static equilibrium, uh, we have two conditions that hold. The first is that the sum of forces is zero, and the second is that the sum of torques is equal to zero. Otherwise, there would be a net linear or angular acceleration, and we'd no longer be at rest. So working with this, we're going to start solving some problems. Let's consider a standard um, example of a statics problem, which says if I have a massless meter stick that's balanced on a point right here, and I suspend a one kilogram mass on this end of it, how much, how, what's the mass that I balance on the other end so that this remains in static equilibrium? Well, if you've ever played on a seesaw or something, you might look at this and say, well, I can sort of consider this based on the lengths involved. This is going to be 75 centimeters, and you know that because it's a meter stick, and guess how long a meter stick is? Okay, yeah. And so this is three times the length of the, uh, the weight that's attached here. So you might guess that, okay, this mass should be a third the mass that's th dropped there just so it balances out. And that's basically playground physics. But we can figure this out from the criteria that are embedded in the static equilibrium physics and, you know, apply math to it, which makes everything better. 
So we're in a case where we know that the sum of the torques on the system is going to be zero since we're in a static equilibrium. And we're going to consider a pivot point right here at the point of that triangle. If we do that, then we get two torques. We get the sum of the torques is going to be equal to uh, the the sum of the torques is going to be equal to m1 times g times this length here, which I'll call l1. We'll call this one l2, and so that's m1 g l1. The sine is 90 degrees. These are acting at perpendicular angles here. The moment arm comes out, then the force goes down. So those are perpendicular vectors. Sine is 90 degrees and it's acting in the counterclockwise direction. So that's positive. And then the other one is going to be uh, equal to the mystery mass M2 times G times its moment arm, which is L2, and it's acting in the clockwise direction, so it gets a negative sign. So I'm, as all, sign again is uh, 90 degrees, so that's equal to zero, and then I just solve for what M2 is. So M2 G L2 is equal to M1 G L1. The Gs cancel out, and so that M2 is equal to M1 times L1 over L2, Plug in my numbers, one kilogram, uh, that's 25 centimeters over 75 centimeters. That's actually a 75 centimeters, which is one third of a kilogram. Brilliant. Okay, so as kind of expected, the mechanics of statics give us the basic framework that we might examine. But then we can start getting into more hmm, interesting problems. So... To solve these hmm, interesting problems, we're going to follow a few basic tips. First, we just set the sum of forces equal to zero. Draw a free body diagram, solve the forces uh, to be equal to zero. Then pick a point somewhere to calculate the torques around. It doesn't matter. It's not rotating, so you can pick any point in the system to calculate your torques for. And so, much like, say, the zero point of energy, we want to pick something that makes our math easy because we should be lazy. And so that means we look for cases where we have unknown or complicated or a lot of forces and pick that as your pivot point. Then the moment arms are zero and none of those torques matter. So it's fantastic. You can even pick two different points and the torques are going to be zero on both of them if you need different systems of equation. Then set the sum of torques equal to zero and hope you get closed systems of equations. Let's give it a try. Well, here's a piggy bank. Uh, it is suspended on a rope here from a little uh, system. There's a massive rod here, has some force uh, acting on it. And it's uh, going to, you know, it's attached to the wall with a hinge so it can kind of flip up and down. Then there's like a little uh, knob up top and this cable is attached uh, here. And what we want to do is understand what's the ta uh, cable tension that keeps the system in static equilibrium uh, so that the P bank does not sort of fall down and the hinge doesn't slide around or anything like that. So we can write down what the uh, forces on this system are. So we can simply say the sum of the forces is equal to zero. So we write down the forces on, and I'd say the th object that we want to consider here is the rod. So we'll focus on the rod. And uh, when we look at this, we're going to see that the forces on this are going to be, okay, I picked the rod because it's kind of the central object in the system, and if it doesn't move, then nothing else is going to move. And so we can look at this to see if we can pull out a um, set of equations. So let's get a free body diagram. So the forces on the rod, well, we've got some hinge force. I actually don't really know what the hinge is doing. So it's probably keeping it up or down. Uh, let's say it keeps it suspended. That's probably it. We don't know. Seems complicated. Looks like it's a candidate for trying to ignore. Hey, hey, hey. 
Uh, we've got a uh, weight from the rod itself. So this is mass of the rod times G. That'll act right here at the center of mass. So M R times G is a force that's pulling down. And uh, gravitational forces act at the center of mass uh, in a uniform gravitational field, but let's work with that. Uh, so the, they pull down at the center of mass for the system. Uh, we have the cable force. So this is going to be uh, T, we'll call that the tension cable uh, in the cable there. Uh, we also have the case that the uh, um, we have a tension force, we'll call this from the cable. We also have a tension force from the rope that's pulling down, T, R. And so that's going to set up a, a bunch of forces on this system. And, ooh, I bet you that that hinge force is a little more complicated because as I've drawn it, this whole thing is uh, complicated. And so that hinge force must actually be pointing off, not exactly up the wall, but, yeah, it's kind of got to go off in this direction. F hinge. That's not how you spell hinge. We'll just call it FH because, yeah. H is for hinge. Uh, at this point, looks kind of like uh, a system we can solve. We hope we get out some equations from it. What we want to do is then calculate the sum of the torques. And as I've been kind of leading into here, we don't know a ton about the system uh, and what this hinge force is doing. So we're going to pick a pivot point right here. So pick this pivot. And the reason why we pick that pivot is we don't know what the hinge force is doing. Uh, we have figured it out, and we just want to calculate the torques around it. Please, why don't you let us calculate the torques around this uh, system? So we're going to pick that there so that there is no torque from the hinge force. But there is, there are torques from the other three forces. So first off, we know that the tension in the cable is acting at a distance L from the pivot, so we write down T times L. Uh, it's acting in the counterclockwise direction, so that means it's going to be positive, and it's going to be pulling off in that direction, uh, so that cable is pulling in towards the wall. And so the tension uh, times L, and then we have to figure out the angle between them. So if we imagine the moment arm here, um, we sketch in the actual moment arm, as a vector that looks like this. So it goes on up here. There's my moment arm vector. I am going to do that same trick where I'm going to lasso just it, I hope. Yeah, there we are. Yeah. I'm gonna pull it up here. And then I'm gonna, well, annotate it with a little vector head. And I'll just note that the angle between the cable here and the moment arm is going to be equal to the 180 degrees minus theta. This is a straight line, supplementary angles. So then uh, I can take all that away, pop my uh, vector back down, and I will see that my moment arm there is going to be sine of 180 degrees minus theta. So that's the torque from the cable, so T sub C. Then we have to put in the torque from the piggy bank. Uh, so we're going to say that that's minus T times R, also acting at a length L. And then if we uh, grab our vector there, we can pull the vector. We can pull the vector up here, take a look at it, and we see that the angle between that one here is going to be equal to, well, let's construct a little helper line right here. And we'll see that this theta is a vertical angle with that theta, and that's a 90 degrees. So this must be, overall, the angle between them is going to be equal to 90 degrees plus theta. So we are good. So great. Uh, so let's pop that moment arm back down there. Actually, let's take, pop that moment arm over there, get rid of it, we're done with it. Uh, the thing that we need to remember is that this has an angle between them of sine of 90 degrees 
plus theta. Uh, finally, we have the torque from the weight. It has the same angle that the rope is pulling down, because they're both pulling downward. And so that's minus m of the rod, or yeah, m, which is big M, times g. It's acting at a length L over 2, and it's acting at an angle of sine of 90 degrees plus theta. So we're, we're basically set. Um, we also know that because the piggy bank is in static equilibrium, it has a free body diagram that looks like T, and then uh, T of the rope balances with the little m times g. So that means that T sub r I can replace up here with m uh, g, and that gives me my expressions that I need, and of course we're in static land. So this must be zero. Great. And you'll notice that we know everything in this equation except for the variable that we seek, which is uh, the tension force. So let's uh, solve for it. So we get that T in the cable times L times sine of 180. That's actually just sine. Uh, 1A minus theta is sine theta, trig identity power. And then we'll push the other two terms to the other side, which is MG times L, and sine of 90 plus theta is actually a cos of theta, plus big M G L over 2 cos theta, and we'll go ahead and we'll cancel out our L's, cancel, 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 and solve for TC uh, by dropping the sine theta underneath, so that gives us that the tension in the cable is equal to M G cos theta uh, plus mg, big mg over 2, cos theta, all divided by sine theta. Now we can plug in some numbers uh, to get the desired value here, uh, which will be m, a little m, is equal to 5 kilograms, times g, which is 10 meters per second squared, honest, uh, cos of 30 is root 3 over 2, plus big M, which is the rod's mass, 2 kilograms, also times 10 meters per second squared, uh, and that is uh, divided by 2, times, again, the cos 30, root 3 over 2, all divided by sine uh, theta, which is a half, and then it's calculator time. That's 104 newtons. Calculator power. Well, the joy doesn't stop there, trust me. Let's consider something a little more, yeah, I'd say physics problem-y. Let's look at this uniform rod of mass m and length l that's leaning against the ground and is supported by a massless rope. The ground has a coefficient of static friction, mu s, and we'd like to know what's the smallest value of theta that we have right there before that rod starts to slip. Well, let's first draw, this is a static problem, sum of torques is zero, sum of forces is equal to zero. So let's draw a free body diagram for the rod. Well, it has a weight that acts on it, mg, has a normal force from the ground that pushes up, normal force. It has a tension force from that cable that's pulling to the left, and it has a friction force that keeps it in place. And that has to be going that way. The reason it must be going that way is that otherwise the forces wouldn't balance. And so it just gets scooted off to the side. So we can then calculate some torques on this fine uh, system here. And we're going to pick the pivot point down here at the bottom. So there's our pivot point. And the reason we want to do that is that the normal force and uh, the, uh, oops, the, not that one, and the static friction force are both acting there. And if we pick a pivot points there, they leave the equation. Uh, moment arm of zero, they go away. So let's uh, go ahead and see what our sum of forces will tell us. So the sum of forces in the y direction is zero. And so that's going to mean that the normal force is equal to mg, 
the sum of the forces in the x direction tells us that the uh, static friction force is so it's zero. So that's going to tell us that the static friction force is equal to the tension. And the static friction force is going to be in the maximum case. Otherwise, it will start to slip. So that's going to be mu s times n, which is equal to mu s mg. So we have just solved, got all kinds of relationships between forces. It's like going out of business. So uh, we need to then figure out what this angle is. And that's going to come from the torques. Well, the torques uh, are going to be calculated around this pivot point, and we have two remaining forces. We have the weight that's pulling down, and then we have the tension force here that's pulling uh, across. So the, uh, the torque from the sum of the torques is going to be zero, and the sum of the torque is going to include the tension in the clockwise direction. So that's the tension times the length of the bar, and then if this angle is theta, then we've set it up so that this angle is theta. And then the moment arm is going to have an angle between it of sine of 180 degrees minus theta, which is the same argument we used in the previous problem uh, to figure out that that's the moment arm in the positive direction, plus, oh, actually minus the torque from gravity, which is going to be pulling downward in this case, and so its moment arm uh, is going to come up uh, and be, uh, or rather, it's going to have a situation where mg is going down. It acts at the center of the rod, so it has L over 2. Uh, we have set up where this angle is theta, and so it's going to be uh, minus mg L over 2, so force times moment arm, times the sine of that angle, which is 90 degrees plus theta. And that, as we learned last time, is just cos theta. So that's cos theta. The sine 180 minus theta is also sine theta. And this gives us the tools that we need to, to solve for the angle. So we know that TL times sine theta is uh, equal to, I'm going to push this over to the other side, and get MGL over 2 times cos theta. And that's going to give me some canceling. I can cancel out the um, length of the rod. So we get a nice relationship here that says that t sine theta, t sine theta is equal to mg over 2 cos theta. But we know what the tension is. Remember, back up here, we said that the tension was mu s times mg. So we can say that tension is mu s mg sine theta is equal to mg over 2 cos theta. And then we will, uh, oh, look at this. Those mgs go away. Cancel those. And then we can get a trig solution that says that sine theta divide this cos theta under. That gives us sine theta over cos theta. Uh, is equal to 1 over 2 mu s, uh, and sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. So that means that theta is the arc tangent, tan minus 1, of 1 divided by 2 mu ms. Okay, it's pretty cool. All right, so that's an example of another statics problem that we can kind of pick apart and solve. So statics is just the beginning. Um, dynamics is uh, actually when things leave the case where forces and torques sum to zero. And then we get into the case where the body uh, bodies are in motion and uh, they start to care about both the translation and the rotational dynamics. And one of the themes that I want to highlight through this section is that a given force in a problem will provide both a acceleration and acceleration and a torque. You end up thinking you're double counting things, but it's not. It does both things. And that allows us to solve some problems under the action of uh, the combined action of a force providing both torques and providing forces. So let's consider um, an introduction to this kind of uh, mechanical way of thinking 
where we have this case where we have kind of a roll of paper that's attached to a wall with a bracket. And this is my uh, horrible rendition of it. So we have a little uh, hinge piece here that comes down and attaches to a central axle of a cylinder of paper. And somebody comes along and they pull a sheet of paper off and so that's going to unwind the cylinder in the um, counterclockwise direction. As it does so, there's going to be uh, some friction here. And so the interior of the cylinder is going to be moving up. And so there's going to be a friction force in this uh, body that's going to be opposing uh, the system. So this friction force pushes up. So the wall is going to receive a friction force pushed up. You know, sandpaper or something is going to grind it and try to lift the wall up. Therefore, the wall is going to exert a friction force on the roller pointing downwards. So there's going to be a downward friction force there. This hinge, uh, this sort of uh, bar that kind of keeps it in place, is going to be pulling off in this direction, keep it from falling down onto whoever's pulling the paper. And then there's going to be a normal force acting right here. Uh, that's kind of the roller is being pushed into the wall. So there's a normal force that's pushing out. And then of course there's gravity acting on it and this force is pulling down. Whew, it's a force party. And what we want to do is figure out the magnitude of the uh, force that this rod exerts that's kind of holding things in place and the acceleration of the system as it uh, unwinds. So this is a neat case where we have the sum of the forces on the roller are zero. It doesn't move. It just spins. But the center of mass stays in one place. But the sum of the torques not zero. It's going to spin. So this is a case where we're kind of halfway between statics and dynamics. We have rotational dynamics only. So let's get to drawing the free body diagram of our fine little roller. I'll come on over here. And so we have a uh, rod. So the force of the rod is going to be pointing upwards. So fraud is up there. And since this angle here is 30 degrees. It's also going to have an angle with respect to the vertical of 30 degrees. Uh, and then we have a bunch of additional forces on it. We have the normal force from the wall. We have a uh, gravity that's pulling down, mg. We have a kinetic friction force, fk. And also some yehu down here is pulling on it with a force of 40 newtons. And we'll just call that f. So it's also being pulled down with F. And so this is what our free body diagram starts to look like. Well, we can uh, figure out what's happening by setting the sum of the forces in both directions to be equal to zero. So if I set things up where this is an X, Y coordinate system, the sum of the forces in the X direction is going to say that the F rod times sine theta, and I'm looking at my free body diagram and sort of seeing that component right there, that's F rod sine theta, minus the normal force is equal to zero. Ah, that's great. We've just learned what the normal force is. So that means that normal force is equal to F rod sine theta. Cool. So the sum of the forces in the Y direction, well, oh, there's a lot of them. Uh, looks like we've got going upward, we have F rod cos uh, theta points upward, and then we have everything pointed down. So that's the friction kinetic friction force. I'm going to just write that as mu k times n. Uh, there's a mg pointing down, uh, and then there's a force pointing down. And all of that happens to equal zero. Everything in this problem is specified except for the normal force uh, and F rod. So I will solve for F rod, or I'll solve for the normal force. Hey, I've already done that. And stick it in there and then solve for F rod. So F rod cos theta minus mu k times the normal force, which is F rod sine theta. Uh, is equal to, and I'll push these other things over to the other side, mg plus f. I'll factor out a fraud, f-r-o-d, 
is equal times cos theta minus mu k uh, sine theta. Mu k sine theta is equal to mg plus the force. And so the force from the rod is going to be mg plus f times cos theta minus mu k sine theta. And we can plug in some numbers. Uh, we know what the mass of the roll is. It's uh, right up here. We know what g is. It's going to be 10. We know the force that's being pulled on it, which is f. So this is going to be uh, 16 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared uh, plus 40 newtons, which is how hard we're pulling down on it. Uh, that was way too jittery. There we go. Uh, times cosine theta, which is uh, cos 30 degrees minus mu k, which is right here, uh, 0.25 times the sine of 30 degrees. And we plug in all of our answers and we get that that's a beautiful, lovely 270 newtons. So now we need to calculate the angular acceleration of the roll, and we're going to do this by uh, using the sum of the torques on the system that is equal to I times the angular acceleration alpha. Well, we know the moment of inertia that is specified in the problem, so all we really need in this scenario is to figure out what the sum of the torques are. We need to pick a pivot point, and given all of the forces that are on this rod down here, we're going to pick a pivot point here at the center. And the reason why we do that is it causes the uh, torques from the rod, from mg, to uh, just drop out, and then we uh, and then the normal force has a moment arm that is per, uh, parallel to the normal force, so it also drops out. So that means that we can just calculate what the uh, torques are from just the force that's being pulled down. So that's the force times the radius uh, times the angle between them. But the moment arm here is perpendicular. So that's just going to hit the tension uh, in the rope at a 90 degree angle. Uh, so they're equal. It's in the positive direction. Everything's great. And then in the opposite direction, we have a negative torque from this friction force pushing down. It's also acting at a distance r from the center of rotation. So that's going to be minus mu k times the normal force times the radius. And that's equal to i alpha. Cool. Well, Back in the previous slide, when we were having uh, a delightful time, we calculated that the normal force was equal to the force of the rod times the sine of 30 oh, the angle, which was 30 degrees, and the force of the rod was 270 newtons, so uh, times sine 30, which is also known as a half, that's 135 newtons. So we know what the normal force is from the previous problem. And we can solve for alpha. So alpha is going to be equal to fr minus mu k nr all over the moment of inertia. And then that is equal to 40 newtons times the radius of the roll, which is 0 0.18 meters, specified right there, uh, minus the coefficient of kinetic friction, 25 or 0.25 times the normal force, 135 newtons, times again the radius, 0 0.18 meters, and then we'll divide all of that by the specified moment of inertia, 0 0.260 kilogram meters squared, and out pops 4.32 rad per second squared. Great. Whew. It's a lot of uh, statics. Let's start and uh, let's start to think about what happens when things are actually moving. Uh, we want to consider the first the case of rolling motion, and rolling motion means that what what you see when an object is rolling along and is in contact with the ground at a certain point. 
So that point uh, is going to have zero velocity with respect to the ground. And that comes from like when a tire is rolling along, it's not moving or sliding against the surface. It comes down, touches the surface, and then lifts back up, kind of also how feet work. Um, and so what's happening here is that we have a, specif uh, a specified relationship between the angular velocity of a rolling object and the velocity of the center of mass so that the tangent velocity of that motion is zero here. And so as this wheel rolls uh, across uh, this uh, green expanse here, we always have the point that's in contact with the ground is going to have zero uh, tangential velocity with respect to the Earth. This leads to kind of a peculiar motion. So if you watch a uh, point on the rim of a motion, this is a old uh, stop motion uh, photograph of a rolling object that has a little card that's been attached to the edge of it. And it traces out this weird pattern uh, that's called a cycloid. And that's because it comes down, it touches the ground, and then it goes fast over the top. And you'll notice that the spacing between these kind of decreases, and then it slows down. So it's this weird motion of what a single point on a rolling wheel looks like. And that arises from two uh, a combination of two pieces of motion. So a rolling wheel has translational and rotational velocities. And if we think about that the vector sum of what happens if a round object is moving off in one direction and it has some velocity vectors and they're all the same and they're all going in one direction here. The object is also rotating and so that means if it's rotating around its center of mass it's going to be spinning here and there's no additional motion at the center. And then we just add vectors. Let's slide these two together and consider their vectors. Well, First off, uh, at the center, there's no rotational motion. So the center of mass moves along with the translational speed uh, there. If we look at the motion at the top of the wheel, the translation and the rotation vectors line up. And so it's moving twice as fast along the top of the wheel. If we look at the rotational vector at the bottom, the translation is going that way, and then rotation is pushing back in the other direction, and so that balances out. So we get our desired v equals zero at the bottom, and then these other vectors are adding at 90 degree angles, and so you get resultants that are pointing off in different directions, showing you the velocity vectors of every individual point on this wheel. So even though the wheel is moving forward at a constant velocity, the points on the rim are doing very strange motion, like so. Uh, and so they combine. And so you get that the top of the wheel moves fast, and then it slows down and to zero when it comes into contact with the ground and executes this uh, cycloid motion as we're going. But specifically, we get the relationship that this only works if the rotation speed is going to have the same magnitude as the velocity of the center of mass at the edge of the wheel. So we require V equals R omega uh, to, for this rolling motion to work. And so we get problems like this. What is the angular speed of a car tire for a vehicle that is traveling at 30 meters per second if the radius of the car tire is 30 centimeters? This is just saying if you're rolling without slipping, then the velocity of the center of mass of the wheel must be equal to r times omega. Therefore, omega must be equal to v over r, and that is just 30 meters per second over the radius, which is 0 0.3 meters. And so that's 100 radians per second. As long as that holds, the wheel is not slipping on the ground. And so we get uh, rolling without slipping as it moves along. All right, let's consider a rolling motion problem that's a little more complex. What we're going to do here is we have a uniform solid cylinder of mass m1 and radius 2r. That's right here. It's resting on a horizontal table. There's a rod through the center of that. 
attached to two uh, strings and they're going to be pulled along uh, and connected to a longer string that goes over a massive pulley and is attached to a mass suspended over uh, the pulley. Uh, this M1 here is going to have a radius of 2R, so some variable times 2. This uh, little pulley is going to have a radius of R, and they're going to be pulled along. So the thing we need to pay attention to primarily in this problem is the coordinate system. So I'm going to specify a possibly normal, ordinary coordinate system where x and y are going down here. And then I can write down the forces on these, uh, on these objects. So I'm going to write down the forces for m1 and m3 because they're the objects that are actually accelerating in terms of their center of mass. Let's start with M3. That's the most straightforward. It has a free body diagram that looks like M3G. Uh, the tension force is pulling up. And then M1 is going to have a uh, force uh, that is a, a free body diagram that looks like this. There's a M1G going down. There's a normal force going up. There is a tension force going to the right. And then there is a friction force that is going backwards. And that friction force is what keeps the roller rolling without slipping. So that's cool, but it must also act as a friction force to slow down this object. So that's important here, is that it does two things. It provides the torque to keep it rolling without slipping. It also slows down the center of mass. So this kind of sets up our problem here. Finally, we have torques around a mass too. And the important thing about this is those are provided by the tension forces. And since M2 has mass, that means that those tension forces must be unequal. So I need to be careful here. And so I'm gonna call my tension forces T3 and T1, where we have T1 in this rope, and then T3 in this rope, and those tension forces are going to act to provide the torques around the pulley. So let's uh, go ahead and make some relationships here. So we're going to define the Y coordinate as going down. So we're going to say that M3G minus the T3 is equal to mass times the acceleration of the whole system. So that's cool. Uh, in the x-coordinate for mass m1, we also have the case that t1 minus the friction force is equal to equal to, equal to m1 times the acceleration, where the acceleration is just heading over in the uh, plus x direction, so it accelerates, uh, everything is moving to the right in that case. We also know that the sum of torques on the pulley is going to lead to an acceleration. And we're going to say that, uh, let's see here, T1 uh, times R, and there's going to be a 90 degree angle between them uh, right there, minus T2, uh, sorry, T3 times R is going to be equal to the moment of inertia, one half, m2 r squared and then here's a tricky part the angular acceleration is acting in the opposite direction of sort of standard so we've defined positive torques here uh, to be counterclockwise as usual but uh, when this thing is spinning here it's going to have an angular acceleration alpha 2 but alpha 2 uh, times r is going to be negative a so we know that this is going to be one half times m2 times r alpha 2 times r and then this is going to be opposite direction of the acceleration so this is equal to negative a so that's important because positive angle in this case is going in the opposite direction that the system is accelerating and we need to bookkeep that so then we'll uh, cancel out these r's and end up with a tidy little equation right here that just says that t1 minus t3 is equal to one half m2 times uh or sorry negative one half times m2 
times the acceleration, or T3 minus uh, the T3 minus T1 is equal to a half M2A. We could just flip the order there. Okay, looking good. We've uh, done a force problem and we have three equations. One, two, three, and we have four unknowns. Two tensions, the friction force, and the acceleration. So we need another equation and it's gonna come from the torques on the first object over here. So we set this up and we say, okay, the torques on this system are from each of the four forces that are shown here. And I'm going to pick a pivot here at the center, pivot. And that's nice because T1 and uh, Mg both act at that point, so they have no contribution. So I, if I go to the sum of the torques, I get nothing from the weight, nothing from the tension force, and then the normal force acts at the bottom here. So the normal force pushes up. The pivot arm is anti-parallel to that, so the sine of 180 degrees is zero, so the normal force doesn't create a torque. And so the sum of the forces, uh, the sum of the torques there is just from the friction force times the radius of the object, and that's equal to, oh, and that's a negative, because it's going in the uh, clockwise direction, uh, angular acceleration. So this is equal to minus one half uh, times m1 times 2r quantity squared. So that's the um, moment of inertia for a cylinder. And 2r comes from the fact that we've specified its radius is twice whatever this r value is in the problem. So that's the moment of inertia i. Then we multiply it by alpha. So alpha 1. So the angular acceleration of object one, we have the relationship that again, we've defined a positive angle uh, in the counterclockwise direction, but as it's accelerating linearly, it goes in the opposite direction. So we get the relationship that two R times alpha one is negative A. So this is going to give us one half M one times two R oh, uh, is equal to 2r alpha 1, and I've argued to you right now that this is equal to negative a. And I'm going to just fix up one little mistake I made over here, which is the moment arm is uh, f times r times 2, because it's 2r, it's the radius of the object, but we've called it 2r in this problem. Ah, it's maddening, maddening, 2fr. And this will uh, cancel out. So we get a 2 and an r and a 2 and an r, and then a negative sign cancels out. So we have an expression for the force, which is equal to 1 half m1a. So that gives me a nice expression for the um, uh, magnitude of the friction force. And we finally have closed the, the system. So what we'll do is we will stick in our expressions for uh, t1, and T3 into here, uh, this expression right here. So let's stick in and we see that uh, T1 is equal to M1A plus F. So that's equal to three halves M1A uh, from this expression right here. Then uh, we know that T3 uh, from this expression, so we know uh, T3 is equal to M3 times G minus A. And then we do T1 minus T3 is equal to minus a half MA, M2A. And then we'll plug in our expressions for T1 and T3. So this is equal to three halves M1A minus M3G plus M3A. And then uh, we will go ahead and collect M3G over there and all the other terms on the other side of the expression. So this is three halves M1A plus one half M2A plus M3 
A is equal to M3G. And then finally, we get an acceleration. Oh, running out of room here. So we get an acceleration that is equal to M3G divided by three halves M1, M1A plus M2 over two. Oh, so there's no A in there because we done factored it out. So goodbye to you. M1 plus M2 over two plus M3. Oof, that's a mess. Uh, let's rewrite it on up here. So A, as we have solved, is M3G over 3 halves M1 plus M2 over 2 plus M3. All right, and that is our lovely final answer. Uh, a lot was going on in there, and so it's important to remember we have to pay a lot of attention to direction uh, of angles and torques relative to acceleration, and we used the expression that uh, we were in rolling without slipping motion to eliminate uh, the uh, to uh, eliminate the friction forces and figure out how it was rotating the system. So, awesome. Okay, for our next example, we want to consider a case uh, where the rolling motion and the translation motion aren't actually connected to each other, at least initially. Uh, what we want to do consider here is a solid ball of mass m and radius r that's sliding with an initial angular speed of zero. So it's just moving along without any twisting until it reaches a rough patch here, which has a coefficient of kinetic friction mu k. I'd like to know how much time will pass with the ball rolling along the rough patch until it is rolling without slipping. So we have uh, two cases at work here. We have, uh, or we have two things we need to consider here. We start out by considering a free body diagram for the ball. And there are going to be three forces on it. There's a normal force pushing up, a weight pushing down, and a kinetic friction force uh, that is going to be mu k times n. And this is exact. We know that it's mu k times n uh, because it's kinetic friction. It's not static friction, which varies uh, until it uh, starts slipping. So then we also consider the torques around our ball. And so we have, I'll just annotate those on the ball. So we have a pivot point that we'll pick at the center. We have a moment arm that we draw down, and then the friction force is pointed backwards. So FK there. And so this is the moment arm. And in this case, that's going to be acting in the counterclockwise direction. So that's going to lead to a positive torque here. So this system is going to have a um, uh, torque uh, accelerating it around in the clockwise direction. And the sum of the torques is going to be I alpha, and that's going to be equal to fk times the radius of the ball r. So let's go ahead and continue solving that out. So the moment of inertia for that is going to be a 2 fifths mr squared times alpha. And we don't get to say that r times alpha is equal to um, a right away. Uh, it's going to get there. But this is just going to give us our angular, uh, our angular value. Uh, our, it will give us our angular acceleration here. Uh, we can use the relationships from the free body diagram to state that the normal force is going to be equal to mg. And then the friction force is therefore going to be equal to mu k mgr is equal to 2 fifths mr squared alpha and I'll cancel out one of the powers of r and then solve for uh, the angular acceleration. So I get alpha is equal to uh, five halves mu k m g uh, all over m, and those m's will cancel out. So I get the acceleration is five halves mu k, uh, mu k times g uh, is equal to alpha. And then the missing power of r uh, that came along when I divided it. There we are, u k g over r. Now we've got units that work out, so that's a proper angular acceleration. 
Uh, so next we need to consider a linear acceleration. So we know that the sum of the forces is equal to ma, uh, not equal to the alpha yet. Uh, and so that is just going to be mu k times uh, n, which is equal to mu k mg, and it's acting in the opposite direction of the acceleration, so it's just going to be negative. And so we can relate the angular velocity uh, for this system uh, at a given time and the angular acceleration uh, to the or the linear acceleration to the velocity at a given time. So we know that in the future, v is equal to v naught, I'll call that v naught, uh, minus uh, or plus a t, which is equal to v naught minus mu k m g t. And we also know over here that omega is equal to omega naught, that's zero, uh, plus alpha times t. And then alpha times t is just going to be five mu k g over uh, two r t. And we're going to solve for the criterion that omega times r is equal to v. That would be the case where the rolling is not slipping. So you'll notice that the effect of the acceleration is to slow down the ball and speed up the angular acceleration. So we're going to say that, you know, solve in the rolling without slipping criterion. And so in that case, we get that uh, omega r is equal to 5 mu k g t all over 2 uh, as omega r is equal to v, which is equal to v naught minus mu k m g t. And then we can uh, bring this over and get that uh, the v naught is equal to 5 halves plus another 2 halves is 7 halves mu k g uh, times t. And then t is going to be equal to 2 v naught over 7 mu k g. Okay, there we are. It's how long it takes until it's rolling without slipping. And so the key point here is we solve for when omega r is equal to v. Okay, uh, I think that's a lot of examples. Goes through uh, this in all the different flavors that we can see. Uh, I will note that um, we can consider the rotational work acting on a system. And we think about the incremental bit of linear work that's done on a rotating system as the force dotted with a tiny little step in the uh, in direction, which we'll sort of treat as linear, so f dot ds. But for a rotating system, that can just be the tangential force that's moving in that sort of uh, small increment ds. And that little bit of arc we will write as r d theta, and then you'll notice that this f times t, or f t times r, is equal to the torque times d theta. And so then we can integrate this expression up through this tiny little bit, add them all up, and we get a work, which is the integral from one angle to the next of a torque through the angle. And so then uh, we can finally uh, also make the note uh, that this torque is equal to i alpha. And so then we can write down the integral of i alpha uh, d theta. And so that is uh, this integral, i alpha d theta. I'll rewrite the alpha part here as d omega by dt. It's the definition of alpha. And then engage in a little bit of uh, change of variables by considering d theta by dt and d omega d theta. So basically do a uh, sort of chain rule expansion uh, we know that the product of these two derivatives is going to get back to d omega by dt by the chain rule. But then we recognize that d theta by dt here, why, why that's omega. And then the integral of d omega by d theta, uh, that's just the integral of d omega, so this is integral of i omega d omega, which is one half i omega squared, and that's the change in rotational kinetic energy. We used an exactly similar formula by using the VDV equals ADS relationship in linear. Uh, this is the same reasoning just applied in angular coordinates. So 
That's all I'm going to say about rotation work. We have a work energy theorem. It's well developed. Um, I'd like to now turn to the uh, relationships for energy. And uh, we'll start, or for momentum. And we're going to start out with the scalar version of the angular momentum problem. Uh, and we'll define angular momentum as basically mass times velocity, but using the analogs of rotational uh, products. So mass becomes moment of inertia I. Omega is the velocity. So we're going to define an angular momentum with a vector or with letter L as the uh, angular momentum. And we're going to use the same sign convention before. Positive is going to be counterclockwise rotation. And so this kind of follows the idea of a point particle moving around in circular motion. Uh, in that case, it's going to have a momentum that's equal to m times v. And if I take that mv, p is equal to mv, and I end up multiplying that by r, I'm going to recognize that that angular momentum l is uh, going to be m times r squared times omega using this definition here. And I'll put one of those r's onto the omega, and uh, it becomes mvr in circular motion. So we're able to kind of recognize that a particle moving around on a circular orbit is going to have angular momentum mvr, and that's the equivalent of i omega. So this seems like a good, workable, consistent definition. Uh, we're going to formally bring in the vector power and note that L is going to be R cross P, just like torque is R cross F, the R always comes first. And so that uh, is the vector angular momentum fixed. And then this vector angular momentum is also L uh, for a rigid rotating object is the moment of inertia times omega uh, as a vector. Moreover, we can uh, take the time derivative of r cross p and apply that product rule to say that this is uh, dr by dt cross p and then r times dp by dt. Now notice that uh, dr by dt is v, that's the velocity vector, and we're going to cross product it with the momentum vector, and that particular term goes to zero because anything crossed with a vector parallel to itself is zero. The other term is going to be uh, the r times dp by dt, but Newton's second law tells us that that is the net force, and so r cross f is the torque. So we have derived that the time change in an angular momentum is the vector torque uh, on the system. So this holds for any system of particles as long as all their internal forces are going to act along lines between them. So their relative moment arms are aligned with the forces and those go to zero, which is most things. Most rigid uh, bodies are having forces that act along uh, the lines between the individual particles. And that allows us to say just for uh, linear particle or uh, rigid systems as a whole, we can apply this version of the rotational version of Newton's second law. So let's actually uh, think about how to apply this. Well, first off, much like collisions and other cases, if we have no net torques, then we have a conservation law. The angular momentum of a system is uh, conserved. And this is you know, useful in a lot of things. Things keep on spinning, but it's also very helpful in cases where you have kind of radial motion in uh, a circular system, because then there is no change in the um, no change in the actual angular momentum, and there's no torques because all the forces are acting along the moment arms to like pull things in or push things out. And these are often cases where we can really get a handle on there being a conservation of angular momentum. So uh, let's think about this in this case. So we think about a playground merry-go-round that's spinning without friction once every five seconds. And the merry-go-round is a disc with a mass of 100 kilograms and radius of two meters. And a kid walks from the center out to the edge of the spinning merry-go-round. And we'd like to know what the rotational period of the, of, of the system is after the, after the kid walks out. So the way we do that is we uh, consider this at the beginning to say, okay, there are no net torques on the system. So sum of torques is zero. And so L, which is equal to I omega, is a constant. 
So that means we can write down the moment of inertia before and the angular speed before is equal to the moment of inertia after times the speed, uh, angular speed after. The moment of inertia before is one half m r squared, and then this is two pi over the initial rotation period, t initial, r, uh, yeah. And then afterward, the moment of inertia is the same thing, one half m r squared, but there's now a small particle on the edge, so we say that's plus little m r squared, new moment of inertia, it times two pi over t final. So then we can solve for t final. We will do some uh, cancellating here, and we will get that the uh, new angular period, t final, is equal to t initial uh, times a half m r squared plus little m r squared all over one half m r squared or t initial times uh, looks like uh, one plus two little m over big m which is equal to five seconds times one plus two times 30 kilograms over 100 kilograms and that comes out to eight seconds. So we took this, you know, this is basically changing moment of inertia because it's purely radial forces. They exert no torques. Therefore, uh, some of the torques is zero. Now, what's weird is that particles moving in a straight line also have an angular momentum, but it's specified with respect to an observer. And so if you think about this observer here in red, watching a particle go by, in um, uh, moving along with velocity vectors v here shown here in blue and a moment arm of that radius r there's going to be a moment of inertia so the angular momentum is i times omega and if we think about the omega that is going to be just the perpendicular component of the velocity is going to make it appear like this uh, body or this part black particle is moving around and you're changing angle on it. So it's going to have an angular momentum. And the magnitude of that angular momentum, and we're going to write this as mr squared, so r squared times m, mr squared, times omega, and that's just the perpendicular velocity component over this radius. So that is going to be the apparent angular speed. And then we're going to cancel out one of the r's. And we'll note that v perpendicular is v times the sine of this angle between uh, r and uh, v here. So I always like to uh, showcase that this r sine theta is actually just this perpendicular distance here as well. So we can sort of think about this as just mr v times whatever the speed is projected perpendicular uh, to the uh, line of sight. So at the minimum distance is when the angular speed is the largest, and we can kind of figure out what that uh, component is for a given angle theta. Uh, so as an example, uh, I like to run across the classroom at a fairly pokey speed of seven meters per second. And so you can actually calculate what my angular momentum is as just saying, oh, this is my mass times V times R. And if we're off at some angle, we're gonna consider sine theta to be 90, uh, which is directly in front of someone in the front row, uh, say they're four meters away, and you just calculate the angular momentum based on this distance here, how fast I'm traveling, and how big I am. Now, this means that uh, different observers are going to see different angular momentum for a given particle. And this is analogous to how you have different momentum depending on your inertial, what inertial frame of reference you're in. So this is going to matter that you actually have to pick an origin and figure out what your angular momentum is. So this weird formulation of, oh, straight line particles have linear uh, angular, mo angular momentum can be useful in angular momentum collisions. So here's an example of a person. This is a top-down view of a human. There's a little nose there. Uh, sitting in a chair. Uh, it's a swivel chair, so it spins freely. Uh, they have a mass of 80 kilograms. And as we know, people are modeled as solid spheres 
with a radius of 40 centimeters. You know, people, they're spherical. Uh, and so this uh, human being sticks out their arm and they catch a ball that's flying in a straight line into their arm uh, there. They catch it and then they uh, start to spin around because they intercept that momentum. So what we want to do is figure out the angular speed of the swivel chair and person after catching the ball. Now, if we consider this whole system here, there are no external torques on it. So the angular momentum before is, or after is equal to the angular momentum before. Initially, the angular momentum, I'm going to say uh, we can treat it right here when the ball is flying into the person's arm relative to their distance uh, is going to just be uh, relative to the center of rotation is just going to be the mass of the ball times that distance of uh, R, well, well, let's call it D, and then uh, times how fast the particle's moving, which is V, they catch the ball, and that's the initial angular momentum. And then afterward, they start to spin with a moment of inertia I uh, times omega. So if we want to figure out omega, we just say that omega is equal to Li uh, over I, omega, uh, I, which is mass times the length of the arm times how fast the particle was moving over the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia in this case is going to be the solid sphere moment of inertia for the human, two-fifths m r squared plus uh, the ball, which is caught out at a distance of one meter away. So that's the little m times d squared, and that's the angular speed. We just plug in some numbers. So that's going to be half a kilogram times 10 meters per second times one meter all over two fifths times the mass, which is 80 kilograms, times the radius of our spherical person plus uh, half a kilogram times one meter quantity squared. And then we grind this all out and we get that they are turning around at 0 0.89 rad per second, which is the result of them catching the ball and then the, picking up that inner angular momentum and turning it into them spinning around. So the last thing to talk about is to really emphasize that angular momentum does come with this vector nature. And we're not going to dive into too much detail about it here, but we'll wait until we're in class and can really see some angular momentum vectors in action. But I will note that since torque is the time derivative of the angular momentum, uh, and that torque may not point in the same direction as the angular momentum, then you can actually have the torque changing the direction of the angular momentum. And this is often seen in a phenomenon of gyroscopes, which is there's this big spinning mass here and it creates a angular momentum vector out along its axis, right hand rule, where it spins, out it goes along the axis. And then if something is creating a torque that is not aligned with that angular momentum, it may not make it larger or smaller, but it may just change its direction, leading to this phenomenon called precession, where the gyroscope will just kind of roll around here because the torque and the angular momentum are not aligned with each other. So stay tuned. I just want to bank this fact, and then we'll come back and analyze it when we have a gyroscope that we can actually literally see in action. So that brings us to the end of rotational dynamics and to the end of Newtonian dynamics. So we're going to explore a lot of these topics as we go forward uh, and kind of bring all of this stuff together. Then we're going to ask what happens when everything that I told you starts to break down. But that's a story for a later time. For right now, let's uh, go and explore how things turn.